What's up? Welcome to part two of Crash Course AP Environmental Science Edition. Mining. So during the mining process, you have different things. One such thing is slag. This is the stony waste matter that is separated from metals during the smelting or refining of ore. So if you want to refine gold, for example, you might have excess waste, and this would be the slag. Tailings are the materials left over after the process of separating the valuable fraction of an ore from the uneconomic fraction. So if you're trying to mine, say, iron, the uneconomic portion, such as the rock, would be the tailings. Overburden is the material that lies above an area that potentially has important goods, such as coal. So first, you might have to dig through the soil and the rock before you can get to the coal, and that is the overburden. Types of mining. They're different types. So one type is underground mining, and this is usually more expensive, but you can also reach deeper deposits in the ground. So coal, much of it is subject to underground mines. Surface mines are typically used for more shallow and less valuable deposits. Sometimes these are like salts. And as you can see in this picture, you can directly start digging. Placer mining is used to sift out the valuable metals from sediments in river channels, beach sands, and other environments. So you may remember the gold rush in San Francisco. Many of the people there use this type of mining. In situ mining is primarily used in mining things like uranium. And you basically dissolve the mineral resource in different things and process it at the surface without removing the rock from the ground. Environmental impact statement. So different companies, when they want to mine, they usually have to submit one of these to the government. And it outlines the scope and the pur purpose of the developmental project. And also describes the context of what is going to happen to the environment and things that they can do to make the environment still safe after this project takes place. Shifting agriculture. This is an agriculture method in which land is cleared and used for a few years until the soil is depleted of nutrients. This commonly happens in the Amazon, where farmers will use the tropical rainforest soil for a while, then realize it's not good anymore, so then they have to go to a different place and cut down more trees. So that's contributing heavily to deforestation. The Green Revolution. This is the third agricultural revolution. And it was the development of higher yield and fast growing crops through using more technology, different types of pesticides and fertilizers, especially nitrogen, that were developed around this time and right before in World War II as well. And also, these types of processes started to go to third world countries such as India to improve the food supply in those areas. And Norman Borlaug started this whole thing and he even won a Nobel Prize for it. Soil horizons. These are horizontal layers that reveal a soil's history, characteristics, and usefulness. So at the top, you usually have the O horizon. This is the humus, the really rich soil. Right below that is the A horizon, which is good topsoil. Under that is the E, the alluviation layer, where different types of minerals start to leach. B horizon is a subsoil where you have slightly less quality soil and then C and R, the bottom, you have the parent rock and the bedrock that really keeps all the other soil in place. Loam versus humus. So loam is a fertile soil of clay and sand containing humus. And humus, of course, is the organic component of soil. It's formed by the decomposition of leaves and other plant material. It's this really rich organic matter and different microorganisms are found in it as well. And many times, different types of soil can be represented in a soil triangle, as seen here. It basically takes the percentage of clay, silt, and sand. And remember, you just trace it and find an intersecting point, And then, wherever that is, you can find the type of soil that a soil is composed of. So loam is stuck in the center. You have the right balance of all three. Soil can be measured in porosity and permeability. So porosity is the measure of how much of a rock is open space. This space can be between the different types of grains or cracks and cavities in the rock. So clay is very porous because water can go into these cracks. Permeability, however, is a measure of the ease with which a fluid, such as water, can move through a porous rock. So sand is very permeable because, as you may know, water can flow really quick through it. Cation exchange capacity, CEC. 
This is the measure of the ability of a particular soil to absorb and release cations. In good soil, you have a lot of these releasing of different types of cations, so there's better circulation and nutrients for the soil. Eminent domain. This is the power of the government to take private property for public use. So let's say the government wants to build a highway through, I guess, your backyard. Well, they can have the power through eminent domain to buy up your property for a fair market price and then evict you, of course, giving you money, but then you have to leave your property for the public good, supposedly. Clear cutting versus selective cutting. Clear cutting is a forestry logging practice in which most or all trees in an area are uniformly cut down. This is really easy because you can just take in the bulldozer and mow everything down. Selective cutting, this is better for the environment. However, however, it's the cutting down of selected trees in a forest. So growth of other trees, maybe smaller trees, aren't affected. But of course, this costs more money because you can't just go and mow it down. Earth layers. The earth is made up of four main layers. The crust, which is the small area on the outside, which where we live. Also, the mantle right under that. This is like a more molten area. The outer core which is below that, and then the inner core, which is really a hot boiling liquid that no one has ever really gone to. Types of boundaries. Different types of boundaries exist on Earth. You have convergent boundaries, which is two places pushing together. You can find mountains here, such as the Himalayas, because two convergent boundaries started to push together and form these mountains. You also have divergent boundaries. These are places like trenches in the Pacific Ocean because plates are pulling away from each other. You also have transform boundaries that slide right past each other. And these are like the San Andreas Fault in California, where these plates are scraping by at a few inches every year, and sometimes it can cause a big earthquake. Adiabiotic, biotic, the heating and cooling. This is the temperature change which takes place in the upward and downward moving of air, and it's caused by different convection cells around the world. And you'll find different types in different areas. So around the equator, you'll find different types called Hadley cells, and above that, you'll find ferro cells. And at the very tips and bottom of the Earth, you will find different types of polar cells. This really shows how wind and also ocean currents start to circulate. The ITCZ is the Intertropical Convergence Zone. This is a belt of low pressure around the equator, and it's formed by the vertical ascent of warm moist air from the latitudes north and south of the equator. And in these regions, you'll see a lot of precipitation, which is why tropical rainforests can exist in areas such as these. Latent heat release. This is the release of energy when water vapor in the atmosphere condenses into liquid water. So you see this a lot with clouds when they form and also rain clouds start to form and eventually they're going to release heat and then bring a bunch of showers. The Coriolis effect causes moving air and water to turn left in the southern hemisphere, so counterclockwise, and right in the northern hemisphere, so clockwise. And this is due to Earth's spin. When the Earth is spinning and rotating, it's going to produce this angular momentum that is going to move this air and water. And so, this stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is the seesawing of air pressure over the, over the Southern Pacific, and oftentimes it can bring things like ocean currents over to the South American coast, and also upwellings and lots of nutrients. And it suddenly shifts the patterns for the weather patterns and currents in the Pacific, and many times it will bring lots of rain to areas in South America. Thermohaline Circulation. This is the oceanic circulation pattern that drives the mixing of surface water and deep water, and it's really the process that makes upwelling happen and brings all these nutrients from deep in the ocean up to the surface so things like plankton and fish can start to consume it and grow more. Rain shadow effect. This is an effect that shows that when precipitation falls on the windward side of a mountain range, so where the clouds and the wind and everything is, you have lots of lush vegetation and a warm, moist climate. But these clouds, soon they can't move over this mountain to the other side. So right on the other side, you'll have a desert area on the leeward side because it's not getting all this rain and moisture. 
No, oh, let's see a picture real quick. Yeah, so you have the moisturizing air where the water vapor and the clouds are, and the rain shadow region is on the other side where you have the dry air. And you see this in places like the Andes Mountains in South America where the, it starts to block the currents and air from the Pacific Ocean and it's going to create these deserts on the other side. Temperature inversion. This is when a layer of dense cool air is trapped under a layer of warm dense air and pollution is trapped in this layer and oftentimes it can build up to harmful levels. You see this in places like LA and Mexico City where normally you have warm air rising up to the cold air but the cold air has trapped, is stuck between the warm air and different types of areas on the ground and it can start to allow smog to build up. Layers of the atmosphere. There are different layers, such as the exosphere, thermosphere, mesosphere, stratosphere, where you can find the ozone layer, and troposphere, which is around where we live. So thermosphere, it is the hottest region. A lot of UV light is here, and you'll find like satellites. Mesosphere is right below that. Stratosphere is under there. That's where the ozone layer helps to block out different types of UV rays. And troposphere is where planes and balloons are, and it's where we're located as well. Oh, one more thing. The aurora borealis is in the thermosphere, as you can see there. Cogeneration. This is an energy production method that produces two useful forms of energy, such as high temperature heat or steam, which can be used to drive other types of physical processes like more turbines and also electricity from the same fuel source, so a source like coal. And this electricity, of course, can be directly sent to homes for use. And here's an example of this. You have a boiler that can turn a turbine, but it can also pump and heat other things as well. Combined cycle. This is when a power plant uses both the exhaust gases from a previous step of the energy generation process and steam turbines to generate electricity. So it can take this cogeneration and it can use in a combined cycle to generate even more electricity. These are all processes that are used to make energy production more efficient. Oil sands. These are slow moving and viscous deposits of bitumen, which is a type of coal that is mixed with sand, water, and clay. And it can potentially be used, but it has to be extracted first. And you find these in places like Canada in the Alberta oil sands. There are four main types of coal. You have peat, lignite, bitumen, bit, eh, excuse me, bituminous, and anthracite coal. So peat is the most immature type of coal. It's not as old as the other types, and this can be oftentimes found in swamps as organic matter starts to decay. Lignite is a type of coal that has undergone some pressure, heat, and time. Bituminous coal is the coal we oftentimes find. It is ready to use, but it has a lot of sulfur content, so when burned, it's not necessarily good. And the anthracite is the really nice coal because it has a low sulfur content, so it burns more clean. But of course, it takes a lot more time, pressure, and heat to form. And bitumen, we talked a little bit about this. This is a type of degraded petroleum that forms when petroleum migrates to the surface of the earth and is modified by bacteria. And many times we can find this with the oil sands. CTL stands for coal to liquid. It's a process to make solid coal into a liquid fuel that can easily be transported. Sometimes it takes a lot of energy. The Hubbard curve is a bell-shaped curve that represents current oil use and it also helps to project when the world oil production will reach a maximum point. That point is called peak oil as seen here. And it also helps to project when we will run out of oil. So this curve shows that eventually oil will run out and we will need to find different sources of energy. These sources of energy could include renewable energy sources. This is energy such as solar, wind, and hydroelectric that is derived from essentially inexhaustible sources. So the sun may continue to heat air currents, actually it will, and it will also drive water currents such as from rivers as well. And these will help to power different types of renewable energy sources. And as you know, the sun can already create electricity through the photovoltaic effect. 
Other sources that are currently being explored are biomass. This is when different things like corn and sugarcane are grown to create ethanol, which can be used as soil, and also geothermal, where the heating inside the earth helps to create electricity by heating water and electromagnetic induction, and also hydrogen fuel cells, which take hydrogen and oxygen and uses the chemical process to create electricity. Non-renewable sources. These include resources that are considered finite because they don't self-replenish really fast like the sun does. And oftentimes it takes a very long time to do so. So we know the oil we're using today comes from things like algae and dinosaurs millions of years ago. And examples include petroleum, coal, natural gas, and uranium. Uranium, of course, when we finish mining it, there won't be much left. Passive solar. This is a type of solar design that involves light energy transforming into thermal energy. This is a type of design where in the winter time, the sun is directly facing windows so it can heat a room, while in the summertime, it's not. So as a result, you won't have super hot summers or super cold winters. And it doesn't use any moving parts or expensive equipment. It's just the type of design. OPEC. This stands for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It is an international oil cartel that was originally formed in 1960, and it includes countries seen here. Sometimes Russia is included as well. Mostly you see countries in Africa, the Middle East, and sometimes in South America as well. This is the rich areas of oil in the world today. And it represents the majority of all oil producing countries and it tries to limit production to raise prices sometimes. It really wants to control the price of oil because it's such a valuable resource, as you may know. So many countries, such as the U.S., depend on it and have even fought wars in the Middle East over it. And this cartel plays a big role because they control so much of the oil supply. Well, that's it for this one. Part 3 is over here on the left, and you can find the full playlist over there on the right. Make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share with your friends. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one.